There is something life-changing about knowing that we are loved when we are, in fact, unlovely. There is something equally magnificent about knowing that same one who loves us when we did not deserve it is willing to reach out to stoop down to care for us and to help us when we cannot help ourselves. When we look at the cross, we see affection. The first kind of affection reaches out. It's true love. The second kind of affection reaches down, and it is true grace. When we look at the cross, we see love at work and grace on this place, on this play. Have you ever heard of Pat Summerall? Do you know who that is? That sports broadcaster? He wrote a book entitled Summerall. You may not know much about him except he, he broadcasts with John Madden. But he wrote a, a book, published it in 2006. What you may not know about him is that he was raised in a small town in Florida. He felt abandoned by his mother and father. His grandmother raised him. And like many that suffer with abandonment feelings, he compensated. He compensated first with athletics. He was a football, basketball, and baseball star at his high school. So much that he was recruited by the University of Arkansas, where he played football. From there, he was drafted by the Chicago Cardinals. That's right, the Chicago Cardinals. They later moved to, to St. Louis and were called the St. Louis Cardinals. And now they've moved to Phoenix, and they're called the Phoenix Cardinals. He had a successful professional career and then found himself moving up into the broadcast booth. They say, I've never met him, they say he's a very humble and graceful man. But there's a reason for that. His second form of coping with this abandonment that he felt was alcohol. He was a dreadful alcoholic. He tells it all in his book, in a chapter called The Reckoning. I will read from his work as he talks about an event that he was going to broadcast the Masters Tournament in Augusta, Georgia. The opportunity to just to, to be there but he was going to broadcast it. And he says this, I woke in a guest house in Augusta, Georgia, a serene and beautiful place that is home to my favorite, favorite sporting event in the world. But I felt disoriented, queasy, panicked. It was 3 a.m. and something was terribly wrong with me. I struggled to roll out of bed. I staggered to the bathroom. I had gotten sick from too much drinking before. Far too many times to count, but this was different. As I knelt on the bathroom floor, I felt as if my insides were pouring out on waves of vodka I had consumed 
before collapsing in my bed. My drinking had increased in recent months, and now the penalties were getting steeper. There was blood in my vomit. A few years earlier, I had a similar episode. I bled so badly I had to be hospitalized. I was sick for most of the night, coughing up blood. This continued on and on, on and off the rest of the night. Doctors found a severe ulcer calls, they said, by many years of heavy drinking. I missed several games that I was supposed to broadcast. My bosses at CVS quietly expressed their concern. It should have been a wake-up call for me. I was taking less and less for me to get drunk, another bad sign. I drew deep breaths and tried to compose myself but I still could not fight the waves of nausea. I lowered my dizzy head once more. What was I doing to myself? Finally, I got back on my feet, and I staggered to the sink to splash water on my face. As I looked in the mirror, the fluorescent lights around the medicine cabinet seemed to grow brighter and brighter. They illuminated my pale and haggard face. My bloodshot eyes and all the protruding veins on my face and my nose. I looked like a monster. I was repulsed by my own image. At this point, friends and family encouraged me to enroll in the Betty Ford Center. The intervention was wrenching, heartbreaking, and profoundly embarrassing event in my life. I will be forever grateful for it, even though I still, with all the painful feelings it recalls. The Betty Ford Center is a top-of-the-line addiction facility, but they keep the accommodations intentionally intentionally sparse. They only give two books to read. The Alcoholics Anonymous book and the Bible. I read the AA book a few times and put it aside. But I kept coming back to the Bible. To my surprise, I found it engrossing like some code book to a world I have heard about, but I never delved into. After my baptism, I found myself reflecting and identifying with that classic gospel song, Amazing Grace. Particularly those familiar Lines. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. While he was wretched, choking on his own vomit and blood, he was led to discover the one who had loved him and had loved him all along. You see, the Lord had pursued him through the words of the Bible. As a poet once said, the hounds of heaven were pursuing him. While worthless and wretched, God had loved him. Like the horizontal beams on the cross, his love reached out around him. And like the vertical beam on the cross, his grace had reached down to rescue him. We read Philippians chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. Listen to the words again this morning. Let each of you look not on 
to his own interest, but also to the interest of others, having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. In this beautiful picture, we see Jesus enthroned in heaven. But there came a day that the Father declared, in order for the sinner to be rescued, a sacrifice must be offered, a debt must be paid. And what did he do? The Son what? He left heaven. He moved into the neighborhood. And he became what? He became a servant. Why? Why on heaven? Why? Why on earth? Why in heaven's name? Why would Jesus do this for sinners? If you have your Bible, turn over to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. It's a familiar passage. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all ye who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Rest. Whatever your drug of, drug of choice, come unto me. All you who are weary and burdened, all who cannot conquer their own lust, those that are wearied and burdened by pornography, those that are wearied and burdened by food, by lust, by beverage, by a container of pills. Whatever drives you further and further down into the ditch, wearied and burdened, like Pat Summerall, who was in, in that spring night in Augusta, Georgia, he called himself what? Wretched. But Jesus says, what? I will give you rest. Now look at verse 29 of Matthew chapter 11. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Do you underline in your Bible? Gentle and humble in heart. What is that? That is humility. Christ-like in one word, humility. How could someone so holy and pure love someone so broken, so dark? so depressed. It's called love and it's called grace. What do we mean by this concept of humility? Servanthood, if you will. It is a willingness to give up my will for another's good in order to accomplish what is best. Let me repeat that. You give up my will for another's good to accomplish what is best. Humility is a desire to serve rather than to be served. Have you heard that before? You have, because you heard it in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45... For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life for a ransom 
or as a ransom for many. The Christian life is a life of serving and giving. We must remember the words of Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Learn from me, serving and giving. Brethren, we have a difficult time with this. We are at times narcissistic. Life does not evolve around serving others. It's about serving what? Ourselves. Life revolves around us. Is it about your comfort? Is it about your satisfaction? Is it about your income? Is it about your control, your will? That is narcissistic. We struggle at times with servanthood. We reject the one who modeled for us the true meaning of humility. That is Christ. He came from heaven and became a servant to the point of death, death on the cross. When we look at the cross, the arms reaching out represent love. And the stake reaching down represents grace. And that's the cross. That humble servant who came down and put himself on that cross for us. Love and grace. That's the cross. I've heard it said once that love that reaches up is adoration. And love that reaches out is affection. But love that stoops, that's grace. I would like to conclude this sermon by looking at one of the most popular parables of Jesus. It is an image of our Savior stooping. It is the only parable that Jesus taught that gives specific locations. Jerusalem and Jericho. Do you know which parable it is? And who is my neighbor? In Luke chapter 10, verse 29. And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him, beat him, and departed, leaving him for half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And he went to him, and he bound his wounds, pouring oil and wine. And then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Do you see that this parable covers all that we have talked about this morning? The narcissist. That's the priest and the Levite. It's the sin of indifference. It is the sin of inconvenience. Don't inconvenience me. I don't want to serve. I do not want to help. It covers the traveler. You see Pat Summerall? 
do you see yourself? Hopeless. In need of what? Rescue. And it covers the Good Samaritan. That's Jesus. What's the first thing he does? He stoops. He draws near. He is compassionate. He pounds the wounds. He carries. He paid it all. To those of us that are washed, do you ever feel Paul's long index finger tapping you on the sternum when he says, have this mind in you that was in Christ. We have to have a a mind of service, of servanthood, of love, and of grace. And to you that are unwashed, do you hear those heavenly hounds? They're pursuing you. You'll find them in his word. If you have a need, if you need to be rescued, come forward and wash away your sins as we stand and sing.